rolling, guys. So first of all, all right, this is like our first, uh, I don't know, FC defensive discussion. How's that? I say defensive, but we're going to get in the pocket of infielding and kind of that, that meat and potatoes that, uh, um, that really we kind of all thrive on. So what I'm going to start off with, you guys, is I'm going to ask you a question, right? So it's a panel discussion. And so, Tony, what I'll do is I'll start with you, and then we'll go to Jason, and then we'll go to you, Vic, all right? But if I just ask you, like, when it comes to defense, talking about defense, what is most important to you? When, you, when you, you're thinking defense, you're going to work defense, or the, the outcome of your work with your teams defensively, right? What, what is important to you when you're thinking and working defensively or an outcome? What, you know, what you, concepts? You know, it's kind of crazy. It's throughout the years that I've been doing this, I think just being ready just being in your most athletic posture possible, expecting every ball to be hit at you. I mean, if we're talking, you know, individually and defense and what kind of player you're going to be, I, I, I just think just being ready, just, just, and, and a lot of players uh, may think they're ready and they may take a pitch off and, and they come close to making a great play, but it comes back to just being ready. That's awesome. And we're going to come back to that because I want you to describe that ready position and kind of what we see, right? What's typical. I think people don't realize what we see in social media, the different pictures and the videos we see. So we're going to get back to that. Jason, how about you? What comes to mind and what's important to you when you think about softball defense? Um, I like what coach Tony said, being ready first, but um, for me, I like them to kind of be on the same wavelength in their brain. You know, like if one girl's going to go this way, we're all on the same page. Because she's going that way, we're all doing it. You know what I mean? Instead of just, and not only with certain kids, but every girl. Like, this girl's going that. We all got to be going to that motion, you know, and rhythm. Yeah, and sometimes in Hawaii, we got six going and three not going. You know what I mean, coach? <laughs> yeah. Two going and seven. But with this team, we're kind of going. We got eight going and one not going. But for me, I want them to be on the same wavelength and being moving as, as one, you know, and, and being ready and moving as one. So you remember, remember synchronized swimming, all, yeah. the, all the swimmers. So we're talking about them being in sync, right? Being coming synchronized. And then I also think of like those, those uh, sled dogs, right? Up in Alaska when there's like eight in there. So the whole, they're all on the same page though. They're all doing the same thing. They're all thinking the same thing because yeah. that's, that's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I think you didn't even get to the point to where they even know how each other throws, right? Whose throw is going to yeah. go this way, what kind of spin and stuff. So that, that's pretty awesome. Vic, what about you? What do you, what comes to mind when you're thinking about teams defensively? So through the years, I'm going to say I like to keep it simple and think about playing catch, simply playing catch. I mean, how important is that? I mean, we see it every weekend, even this past weekend. If, if we can just play catch, uh, it would minimize a lot that's going on defensively. Whoa. But yeah. Well, that's a great point, too. Uh, the best program I ever played for, as high as a level as we played at, the three questions after most games that we played at were, did we throw strikes, did we play catch, and did we put the ball in play? And then our coach would say, if we do those three things, you'd be amazed at how well we do in a game. Now, if the other team does those same three things, now it comes up to, a, you know, what our specialty plays are and bunting and stuff like that. But right. playing catch is like huge. So, Tony, I want to go back to you and, and, and let's talk about that ready position, right? Is that something that you think is lacking in softball uh, overall? It could be a little better, a little sharper, a little more polished? You know, here's, here's the deal when I, I think about, uh, you know, just being ready. Everyone's different. But in, in your own certain way, it's a feeling, uh, whether it's uh, basketball, football, whatever sport, you know, you just have to be ready and, and everyone's built differently. So what works for you may not work for somebody else. So, but I like just looking at that tennis uh, player on the receiving end where their chest is a little forward or maybe that uh, somebody that's defending somebody in basketball uh, and they have their chest a little forward. So they're on their toes and off their heels and just being able – ready to explode laterally, um, you, you know, but again, you know, you have some girls with long legs, some with short legs, uh, whatever works for you. It's it just, it's a feeling you get. Cause I look at uh, some players and, or some coaches try to put their signature on everything. And uh, again, that's, that may work for somebody, but not for somebody else. So it, again, it's a feeling that you have to work with, you have to play with and, and you, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. But I think tennis is a great sport because, uh, you know, when I mentioned that, that's what you're talking about, 100 plus mile an hour serves that they have to react to and they have to go either way that it's unpredictable. I mean, that's the object is to get it past the past the player. 
but it's that basic position that we see with all sports, defending in basketball, defending in, in soccer, defending in like in basically all sports in that true athletic position. But that kind of brings me to that when you talk about tennis, let's talk about the pre-pitch now, right? And so is it a walkthrough with you guys? Is it, a, is it a hop? Like, you know, and again, and the great thing about softball and that we're going to do is it doesn't always have to be one answer, right? We can all have a, a different idea because it's, it's relaying different things to different people. Absolutely. So how are you guys on that free pitch? Are you walking into it? Are you hopping? Like, what's what, – what, what, what are you? Go ahead, Jay. No, um, I have you asked that, Coach Tony, because we're all over the place here. We've got two hopping – two squatting you know two one or two one stepping in or whatever what, what are you guys uh, the key to that is to be the on most time. effective yeah be yeah, on yeah. Time. i mean they're all time, time. Tony, but we look we don't look like how i say we want i want them to look like one and or leave them alone you know i don't know but on yeah. contact they're there we're all there on contact they're on the balls ready to go left or right it's just on the way there if we got one two hopping two crawling in you know two one stepping in you know, back in the day when you talk about, you know, just being ready, game ready, and you take a look at professional baseball players, you know, guys that get paid millions of dollars to make sure, you know, they're on point every pitch. Yeah. And, and, and they'll creep into the ball. We used to call it creeping. So maybe yeah. right, left. And yeah. so, you're on, again, you're on your toes. There's no way you can be on your toes when you're going backwards. You're going to totally be on yeah. your heels. So that right, left forces you to be on your toes and uh, moving forward. Uh, and then you also have that little subtle hop. I mean, I, I've taken a look at – Derek Jeter many, many times. And, you know, he has that slight hop, nothing too exaggerated. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a feeling that you get and, and, and you got to experiment with it, you know, so, um, but not too low, definitely not too low hips high. So you're ready. Just again, if you look at a basketball player in the pros and, and they're defending somebody, you know, hips are high, they're on their toes and they're just ready to explode right or left. If you're not, you're going to get beat. You can't get beat even with softball. Well, you think about as long what, as, what, what, what do we not to. want? We don't want what we call root foot, right? Where the feet aren't moving, where the where the feet are the last thing to move, right? And so, you know, I think we see that at first base most often when a ball is hit to the right yes. of the first baseman. And I'll always tell our players, look at the first baseman's left foot when she's got her glove in her left hand. The first baseman that moved correctly, their foot goes with their glove as they cross over. The, the, the untrained first baseman will reach over with the glove but the foot stays on the ground and she doesn't quite cover it. And so, it, you know, it's I just basically being light, on, being light on your foot, right? What's that? Yeah. I need my paper and pencil, Coach Tony. That was money right there. <laughs> well, hey, and Jason, watch- we're recording this. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll make it so that you can watch it again. And then, guys, I'm going to – I don't know. I just kind of pulled this up. But this is kind of interesting watching what this guy's doing. It's just, just he's going over different footwork drills, right? But when he when he shows the players, and these are pro players, let me get up to here. One thing I notice is, man, their feet are never on the ground that long. They touch and they're gone. If you look at how long the feet are actually on the ground. And so jumping rope, right? Being able to just spring up from your feet. I'll find another one here. Let's go there. Let's go there. You know, short range, we shuffle. Longer range, we cross over. So he just did both of them right there, right? They've got to yeah. shuffle, and they've got to cross over when they've got to, when they've got to cover greater distances. So I don't know. I, I always think that that's even majestic, the way that they're moving, right? And so that whole ground up type of thing. Um, I Root foot for me is, like I said, when the feet aren't moving at all, and they kind of respond late, right? If we're going to talk <laughs> about maybe being in the air, and we won't get too technical, you know, I tell our players, look, as the ball hits the bat, or hits the catcher's glove, you should be slightly in the air. So then after contact, you're hitting and you can go one way or the other. But, you know, but basically that pre-pitch is, you know, you can walk into it and hop. You can walk into it and just be ready and light on your feet. You can not walk and you can hop, but just don't be stuck. And then I think the last thing I'd like to throw in on that is that uh, I see corners too, t- too many times squatting down too low with their glove down on the ground. And it's like this almost like this Mike Singletary linebacker position, right? But Singletary could react. I see third basemen often that are so low that they really couldn't react to a tennis serve. So we've kind of interpreted a ready position, but if you look at them functionally, they're too low. They sit there too long. They're not rocking back and forth. 
and they're actually a little bit slower. So keep them light on your feet. And then that other corner position, that first baseman, I think is again, they're not, they're not addressed enough because that's actually should be a very athletic position. You've got to be able to field bunts and, and things like that. So, so I'm going I'm to go on to another question with you. And then if you think about like your, if I ask you, what are your favorite drills? You know, what are drills that some of your go-to drills, or you like it when you've got a group of players that you've been working for with a while or working with for a while. And you're like, look, I really like them to be able to, to execute this type of drill. When this drill is executed, it's something that I like my kids to be able to do. It helps them stand apart. And I know that they're starting to get in that pocket, right? So are there any particular drills that you guys are, are fond of and are your, are your go-tos? I'm sure there's more than one, but where would it start that conversation? Tony, let's start with you. Uh, it's, it's always that double play, whether it's from shortstop to second, whether it's third base to second, whether it's second to short. Uh, it, and it's like Vic said earlier, you're playing catch. But when you incorporate a double play, you know, you have quick hands, you've got, uh, you know, arm angles, quick feet, um, you know, all that stuff. You got to move your feet to get to the ball, rock your hips. Uh, it, it, you know, you can't get around the double plays. And it's fun. So, uh, and then you can actually see yourself or see the player progress each and every time, each and every workout. Uh, again, you know, quick hands, arm angles, quick feet. Uh, so definitely double plays, whether it's from the right or left side. So it's that quick turnaround, right? Ball in, ball out, right? A lot of times at practice, I find myself saying, it's the whoop play. Yeah. It's like, whoop you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get that thing in and out. So uh, Vic, how about you? Any particular drills that you like watching the teams do and you know they're in the pocket when they're performing a little better? Yeah, so there's a drill that Tony does at, uh, with our teams and at the clinics, he calls it the reaction drill. He's basically at the pitcher's mound it's a line drive to them uh, at home plate, I love that one. and they either go right or left, and, and they got to do a lot of things, right? Make a decision, move their feet, um, and the girls love it because they're challenged, and they're competing with the other, you know, 10 girls in line, and, uh, you know, that just works everything. The videos you just showed of the tennis players, that's exactly what they're doing on a reaction drill. Right. And so are you trying to hit the ball past them, Tony, and they're, they're trying to knock it down and, and make an ESPN play? What's the, what's the outcome? Well, uh, like anything, like any uh, drill that we do, we want to do an assessment, a quick assessment, see what kind of level they're at. Uh, and then obviously if they're more advanced, uh, but I'm not trying to hit it right at them. I'm trying to hit it to the left, to the right. They don't know what direction I'm going to hit it, even over their head. So you got to be pretty crafty with the fungo just to make sure. But like you said earlier, with the glove, your feet, if the ball's hit to your left, your feet have to make that move and open the hips to the left. Or if it's hit to the right, because you're, you're, you're not going to be able to move quickly if the ball's, you know, hit to the right and your feet are pointed straight, you know. So kind of your feet, you know, the direction where your toes are pointed, that's where, you know, uh, you, you have to be moving towards the ball uh, opposed to just, you know, girls are just reaching, but they're not moving. Would you say, you'd like, you, obviously we've got drills where they're success oriented. We want them to do the right thing over and over, but then there's those challenging drills, right? Where it is maybe a contest or something. And, and that always tends to fall a little more in the pocket of, of fun when the kids are competing for points or us against them or something like that. So, so where do you put that drill as, as far as the repetition? Are they going to execute it most of the time or is it more of a challenging drill where they've got to be able to move and react to something that hits really hard to them? Well, you know, what's funny is uh, what Victor said, it's, it's challenging. So in the beginning, you know, they're going to figure it out. You're either going to catch the ball or you're not. If you're not moving your feet and you're caught up in that imaginary circle around you, you're going to figure out how to get out of that circle and catch that ball. Otherwise, you're going to keep going to the end of the line without catching the ball. So, um, again, it's one of those things where you kind of got to, you know, work in confidence. So you're not hitting it so hard. Now they're starting to figure it out. I think the biggest problem with coaches is they, they kind of treat every player the same way. And you can't, yeah. you know, you got to kind of work in at a, 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 a level where they're comfortable with and still challenging them. But at the same time, once they kind of figure things out, you know, in that same reaction drill, then we'll start hitting a little bit harder, developing range and making sure that that imaginary circle around them, we're either to the left and to the right and, and uh, they're, they're getting it or they're not. But for the most part, <laughs> they're going to get it. They're going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. How about, how about you, Jason? What drills do you like? Um, I'm a coach, Tony. I like the two ball and the, and the backdoor plays, but I just place little gadgets on the ground, like a bat or a piece of wood, and have them show off their footwork, jump over the bat, and then get going into the drill, or jump backwards and then forward on the straightforward plays just to show, you know, their athletic yeah. ability instead of just making a regular play, you know, or ground balls. You know, the fast feet around the bucket drill, 
make a backhand play, all that kind of stuff. I, but I we're like, a little behind because from Big Dog Day on the drills and stuff. That's why I'm happy to be <laughs> with you guys. I can come and look like I know what I'm doing out here. <laughs> Jason, I'm telling you, you're you're showing me videos that you're you're. I think you're only behind up here because you're doing stuff that yeah. a lot of people aren't doing here. You have you have a vision for athleticism, and you have you're implementing footwork that is very important. I'm listen. I don't watch a lot of videos. I usually turn them off. I usually don't. I I, I have to see something that works for me. It has to be something that looks good. We talked about TJ and his football drills and stuff like that. You know, I, I find myself watching your videos. I watch Tony's drills. Like, <laughs> and to be honest with you, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to find people that I want to be able to watch, you know, because there's got to be something to it that holds me down. So quickly, I'm going to show you one of, one of my favorites. It kind of works on a couple things here. It's in our FC school. And it's the shotgun drill. This big right here. Everybody come. Hurry up, come. Run. Run, 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 run. So basically two players, two players are going to start next to each other, next to a cone. I've got the ball up here. And what you do is you can shorten the distance to make it more challenging. So one player's got to sprint back to the base. The other player has to sprint up to the ball. And again, by shortening the distance of the ball, I can have this player throw the ball while this, while this player's still in motion. So just real quick, I'll kind of run it through. I think this was this team's first or second day doing it. And again, bunt plays, quick plays, and we make pitchers, outfielders, everybody's got to do these drills. So if you look at when she's got the balls, this player's still in motion. She's still moving. So it's just called the shotgun. The other thing it needs, it works on is communication. They've okay. got to communicate. So when one player is, is running towards the ball, she's got to hear the player behind her talking because she's got to hear you before she sees you. We know how oftentimes the ball gets thrown and the, defense, the defensive player is not ready for it, right? So that's a little, little something called the shotgun, shotgun drill. So that, that, that brings me next to my, to my next question. What are your pet peeves defensively? So when you see certain things, certain players do certain things, yes, certain sir. motions, what are your pet peeves when you're, when you're watching fielders out there? So, Tone, let's start with you. Uh, huge pet peeve is catching with two hands outside your body. So okay, say, if, say, it, say it again. There's noise. Go ahead. Say it again. So one of, one of my biggest pet peeves is uh, catching with two hands outside your body to limit your range. What you're doing is limiting your range by – Shortening up your 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 length of the arm by reaching with two hands. It's just it's it's just uh, so at a young age we we like to you know make sure when we're playing catch and part of our throwing progression is catching the ball with one hand even if it's in front. So when it's time, that muscle memory is not going to kick in and you're going to catch with two hands and you're going to miss the ball by two inches because you reach with two hands. So again, it's just building that confidence up, uh, especially in these younger players. But I've also seen it in older players where they're reaching with two hands and again that muscle memory is so. Ah, it, it, it's there, and you're going to see it, you know. But, yeah, that's a huge pet peeve, pet peeve of mine. Catching Interesting if I, th I think about, you know, them doing that and reaching with both hands, right? So, kind of, kind of, and, again, I think it's just teaching the players the, the difference between something inside their body frame and something outside because I don't think it's even addressed for a lot of players, right? They don't even realize that. So just simply kind of put, you know, and how to approach those, both of those. Uh, Vic, how about you? Any pet peeves you see with players and things out there on the field? Yeah, one pet peeve is the inability to flip the ball. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, still a lot of, you know, hard throws uh, on a flip. And, um, it, you know, even the older girls, I mean, you know, it's like uh, it becomes a really big part of the game. Uh, and also, uh, you know, on defense and, you know, flipping the ball is huge. And I, I know we start at a, at a younger level, and that's one of uh, Tony's main drills in our clinics is, is working on flips. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, – you know, a lot of girls just not knowing how to flip. So, Tone, I imagine there's a drill or two that you work on to kind of teach that that kind of dexterity, right? I'm thinking of the game flip. So, remember in baseball, the the game flip before the game is you keep your you keep your glove open and you're and you're basically, I mean, you're hitting it at each other, but you're you're really kind of learning that that control of what to do with the glove. Now, I'm thinking of doing it with a glove, but just that that's a supple feed, right? And so, especially with the younger kids, got to kind of break that down a little bit more for them. Yeah, so we'll have a drill. One of our favorite drills is uh, we'll put uh, four cones uh, together like a square. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're 15 feet apart, maybe a little less, depending, you know, on, on the uh, age that we're working with. And maybe we'll start from the ground and flip it to make sure we're not coming back. You don't have, you want to stay inside, show the arm. A lot of uh, players, too, will hide the ball. 
uh, and I know uh, George at Fullerton, uh, we talk a lot about when we get a chance to uh, uh, talk about this or that and technique and skill levels and drills on players, different. Uh, but we, we want to make sure we show the ball. We separate the glove and the ball. If you're a pitcher, you want to hide the ball from the batter. If it's your teammate you're flipping to, remove the glove and feed the ball. Follow the feed like anything else, you know. If it's a backhand feed, you might not need to follow it so much, but definitely if you're underneath the ball coming underneath, uh, you know, leave, leave, your, um, leave your arm out, show the ball as early as possible, and continue uh, your momentum towards the, uh, to the receiver. There's a, there's a difference between shoveling the ball and laying it up for your partner, right? Laying the ball up over the base so they can go up and just get it. And those are two different things. The closer you are to the base, the more you're just going to lay the ball up so the, the Absolutely. Come across, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good Otherwise, stuff. you're going to get handcuffed. You're going to get right. the ball too close. Right. Handcuffed. Distance for shovel, distance for, for laying it up. Jason, how about you? Any pet, pet peeves for you out there? Oh, I muted him. Hold on. There you go. Oh, one more time. There you go. My pet peeve, Coach, is just pretty much not communicating, like, Letting it go with like 10 seconds without nothing, you know, for me and my <laughs> girls. I want them to be talking and being ready, being ready for what's coming at them because you never know where it's going, I tell them. The one play you take off, the one play you decide to take that play off, it's going to come to you. Like, I've seen it happen more times than not. And for me, just, yeah, being ready, being communicating to be ready, coach, you know. Silence and softball don't go together. No, it yeah. bugs right. me, Coach Tony. Yes. And it's funny because on the inside of your mind, you want to be silent. You want to calm everything down. But what yes. are the sounds of a softball game? What it sounds like? It sounds like, you know, no, 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 But we don't want to hear this. Well, that was Yeah. Well, your your kids fill that in in the back. But right, so constant constant chatter. What I think it creates a cadence and a rhythm to the game as well too. And so when you're watching it, you know, uh, you're more drawn into it because you're hearing more noises, right? It's like birds in the trees and stuff. So yeah. you don't want it to be annoying, but you want it to be engaging. So I think that's a, that's a really, really good point on communication. Uh, I've got two pet peeves. One is called the short arm. Oh, Lordy. <coughs> oh, Lordy. So not wow. get, alligator. Not, not, yeah. not, not getting along on those arms. And then over attacking uh, infield, you know, training oh, always at geez. fast speeds. And over, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and just over attacking. So in the end, it's the little squibber ball that the that the shortstop misses because everything's always going a hundred percent, right? And so play the speed of the ball, understand when to be more supple, and understand the true fielding position of flat back. Because if we're to think of like maybe uh, I don't know if there's a lot of myths out there, but we used to always be told growing up, keep your butt down. Keep your butt down. Yeah. But when you actually do that, your chest faces the ball, and it's the it's the worst position. So it sounds funny to keep your rear end up, but that whole flat back, so the hands are out in front, and you can just do that turnaround, right? So it's from here to there, and it just it just looks good. So you know, making sure you're fielding out in front of your body, uh, long arming it with your throws, even that quarterback finish when when there's a finish, an overhand throw, and you finish with that wrist down. It just looks good. It's kind of like I was telling on our, um, uh, on, our, on our national call, hitters that hold their follow-through, you know, when they take their swing. Hitters that hold their follow-through, they're, they're pronounced a little bit more. You can, you can see a little bit more in the pocket, and it just it sustains the moment just the way you see that basketball player hold that finish when they shoot that free throw. So, you know, we're always looking for things. We're not, we're not trying to be different in a bad way. It's like, what are they doing standing out? No, we're, we're looking at characteristics and traits that we see at the highest levels of the game. A lot of times the best players in the game don't even realize they're doing it. It's just part of their natural behavior, right? And then, then you start coaching it and you start realizing, man, you're coaching completely different than when you played it, you know? So just figuring out how to play the game the right way is, is, is pretty important too. But, uh, yeah, those, those are good things right now. And then, you know, I know we originally talked about 7 o'clock, so Sal's about to hop on right now, and he'll be, he'll be excited to kind of pump in. Awesome. I like Sal. He knows his stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, the, the kind of the pocket that I want to find with these conversations is the difference between some technique things that, you know, whether we start to work in and you guys have some videos saved, and I can share the screen like what I did with, 
with you or we draw or just pictures or whatever, but we can get some visual because I, we all know if we go too long into verbal descriptions of drills, people are like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But, <laughs> but there's some really good stuff in this group that we want to share. And maybe what we'll do even Jason is as we, we do this again in a week or two is we break down actually one of your footwork dr footwork drills, because I believe that I see you just using things like that you have yeah. out in the yard, whether it's a rock or a boulder or a log or yeah. whatever, man. And that's good stuff. You know, that's good stuff. You don't always need, you know, a $20 hurdle, right? I mean, yeah. just, you know, you can hurdle over the bat. So you, know. <laughs> you can hurdle over the box. Yes. Hey, hey, Tony, uh, you know, it's crazy that you mentioned that because, uh, Vic and I were watching one of our uh, videos from uh, when we were in Hawaii, God, years ago, and we were in Maui and uh, with Ryan and Jerry, and we were at, uh, where were we, uh, uh, Rodahana at this little deserted <laughs> beach where nobody was at, and we were skipping rocks. And we were just looking at the arm angles. You can't skip rocks over the top. And I was just like, interesting how you just, you know, uh, just just throwing rocks and in order to, and, and again, long, <laughs> like you were saying, it's right. pretty cool. I got to show you that video one day. And how, uh, and how, sat don't. how satisfying is that when you get a 15, 20 skipper, man, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. That <laughs> thing just goes, da, 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 da. but if you think about it, you're, you're creating the same plane as the water. So, so the rock is yeah. just coming, it's, it's skipping in order to do that. It's just like hitting. It's like anything else. You know, when, when I'm teaching sidearm and then I, I explain to the, to the hitters, especially right-handed hitters, I said, do you realize that the sidearm throw is like swinging one arm with a bat, with a one-arm bat, one-arm swing? It's the same thing, but they look at you because, you know, the ball feels different. It's a different type of concept. You're throwing an object, but the actual motion is the same. So they have something built in that they, that feels familiar, but when you put it in terms of throwing, dude, you get the, you get the alligator armitis, man. It's like all over the place. So just really, really slowing things out. Mr. Mata. Hello. Thanks hello. So. What's hey, up? How's it going guys? Good, up, man. Brother? Good, good to have you with us. Sorry for, for that curveball. What I wanted to do is bring it a little closer to our national meeting that we had at, uh, at 5.30 and kind of kind of pigtail on it. So, But just glad you're with us. We're talking a little bit about the game, kind of moving things around. Uh, Sal, if, I don't know if you know Vic and you met Coach Jason before. Is this, everyone kind of new to each other? This is Coach Sal. And, you know, the, you are all on this call because, again, you're a little more in the pocket of meat and potatoes, a def, a, what I call defensive specialist, right? And then here from here, what can we talk about that people that are learning the game – also love defense, but maybe don't understand it as much in the pocket. What can they take away? So it's not, you know, again, it's more like sharing recipes and stuff. So Sal, I'll throw a couple questions to you that we've already, that we've already answered, but here, here's one for you. What's your, what's your, what's your pet peeve when, when talking about, you know, watching defensive players, do you have any pet peeves out there habits that, that fielders do that when you see that you're like, come on, man, let's, let's clean that up a little bit. Um, I would say my biggest, my biggest pet peeves are um, not transferring at contact when we, when, we, when we touch the ball with our glove. And I would say um, not following their throw. I would say those are yeah. the, probably the two biggest ones for me. So I describe, think, describe transferring. Describe foot to foot. Like describe that for me for the average guy that's in. Or okay, for sure. So like what we, what we focus on at our practice a lot is – we transfer the ball when we touch it with our gloves. So we transfer down at the ground. And the reason being is so that when, our, when, when, we, uh, when we get our left foot down, we're ready to throw in our arms in what we call the tight V arm slot. So um, that's huge for us. So when we touch the ball, whether it's backhand, whether it's glove side, whether it's a do or die, we always try to focus on transferring at the ground at contact and getting right into our tight V arm slot. So again, when we shuffle our feet, um, when we go right, left crossover, or we L shuffle, we're ready to throw. And that alone in our program has probably minimized our errors. We've probably cut them in half with the girls that have been in our program for a long time. So that, that part's huge. So as soon as we touch, we transfer. Um, we do the same thing on our, I was just going to say real quick that tight V for mm -hmm. us, you firecracker softball schoolers is called popping the elbow for us, popping the bow, popping that elbow straight back. Can't say bow and arrow anymore. The girls don't know what the heck we mean by that. Right. So, <laughs> yes. You know. so and is that, I mean, that also a feel? Go ahead. Go ahead. So, and the other thing with us and Medina and I talked about is our, 
our big thing is the glove presentation. We don't, we don't go here because from here, it's hard to get into the tight V. So we offset. So we filled everything off center. So then now naturally I can get into that strong position and get into my tight V or bow. Um, so we, we make sure that when we do all of our work with our training glove, we don't go to here because like, look at that. Like I'm having to force my right shoulder to get alligator. So I know a lot of kids got, get taught that coming up. So we actually go off center, which allows us to go here real easy. Right. Um, so that one's huge. And then again, following throws. I don't, I, I tell our girls, I don't care if it's, if, if it's um, the most basic routine play. I need to see them follow the throw. And we talk about sticking our nose right in the, the receiver's chest. And that creates good direction and allows us to not throw open or close. And again, those two things have cut our errors down a lot. Even at the younger levels, we, we now have a 25 team, 2025, which is second year 14s. And we're, we're applying that to this new group that has never been part of our program. And, and it's just, it's, we're seeing gains pretty quickly with those two things. You feel like the following of the throw it helps them keep something on their throw, right? So the throw is strong in the last, you know, percentage of the throw. So it's not dying off tailing. Oh, for sure. You know, we do, we want 12, six trajectory. I know you talk a lot about that, but we also talk about carry. Right. So we don't want the ball dying. We want the ball carrying. So we want them to focus on throwing the ball to a first baseman standing on the fence line on the exterior of the fence. Yeah. So we want carry on the ball. So this way it's easy for our first baseman to receive the throw. It's a lot yeah. easier if they're following the throw and getting their legs into it because the ball stays more true online and it's not doing this at the end. And it makes our first baseman look good. Yeah. Well, and, and there's that, I think we've probably all heard that, that, that phrase of throw through the target, not to the target. Right. So when you're naturally confident, you're, you know, us growing up, we're all trying to break each other's gloves, right? We're trying to make that thing pop. We're trying to throw hard. You know, the young ladies that we work with don't have that natural mentality. So the more that we coach them and the more that we make them self-conscious, if we don't watch what we're doing now, they become apprehensive. They're trying not to make a mistake. They're throwing to the target and the ball's moving all over the place. So throw through that. Also a, a great reminder, uh, for coaches again, because it, I think it shows what type of efforts putting in the throw. I'm, I'm, I'm going to encourage an overthrow by extra effort as opposed to a Judy throw where you're worried about it and it goes into the dirt. So the first air that I want to see is the hardest throw you got from the five, six hole and throw it 20 feet over the first baseman's head, the first baseman's head. Shoot. Even if that goes into the, like in baseball, they say, if that goes into the 10th row in the stands, you don't think a scout's going to notice that they're going to notice that you just aired that sucker out. Now, now can you bring it down a little bit? But I think that that has something to do with it with as well. And then, I, you know, I don't want to completely neglect outfield, but that's where it's most noticeable when they're not using their legs. So where it's, whether it's a skip step or a crow hop or something to use that lower chain, they can have the perfect arm angle, but that it's got too much distance to cover, and then the ball hits the ground, and it doesn't pick up speed. Um, I had the privilege of playing it with a guy that in baseball that would throw – I think I told Sal this, that he would throw the ball from the right field and throw into third base, that the play was at third. His throw would almost hit second base. Like he would crow hop, the throw would almost hit second base, the actual base, and then it would rise and take <laughs> off over the third baseman's head and sometimes end up in the, in the tennis courts. And to this day, I've never seen anybody be able to throw that far. He probably back in the 80s was throwing probably 96, 97 miles an hour. Like wow. if you think about it, because you think about it, you're throwing the ball 300 and you know, 70 feet in the air, 360 feet in the air. You, you do the math on that stuff. You know, you, you've got some pretty, some good stuff on there. So outfielders using the legs and stuff like that. All right, Sal, one more for you. And that is, and it, you, it might be in the same kind of pocket, but when you think about defense, right? When you think about defense, you're about to work defense. What, 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 what's a priority for you? What, what are some of the most important principles defensively that you're looking to incorporate in your players? Um, we do dailies. So like, right after we're when we split up into infield outfield the first thing we do is we work on explosive movements being on time with our pre-pitch and then we work on we do skaters which builds that lateral movement keeping our knee inside our foot instep and then we'll do laterals where we'll pre-pitch land and then we step with our outside foot and push off our we step with our lead foot and push off our outside foot. So it works on being explosive with our first step. So we'll do, we do that daily. We, we go through a whole footwork routine with the girls where we're going 
pre-pitch, laterals, extending the hop, left side, extending the hop, backhand, and then we'll work on slow rollers. So we do a whole sequence without a ball, just our footwork and getting in good posture and learning how to move and play low while being explosive. Um, and and Sal, then I'm after sorry, we- I'm, Sal, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because uh, Tony asked us the same question earlier before you got on, on the call here, and it was that first step, just being ready. So hearing you say that, brother, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome, man. So we, we still, we, you know, I've been around, my son's played for Nate Trotsky's national team. So we use a lot of Nate stuff. It, it's very, um, the girls get it because it's visual. So we do the one where we'll get the softball, we throw it up in the air, it lands on our hand and they gotta be on time. So, you know, they'll pre-pitch land. And, you know, we, we preach pretty much what you preach, Tony. Um, we land in the most natural athletic position, which is, you know, receiving a tennis ball, guarding somebody in basketball, um, you know, a linebacker, you know, where we're at in our hitting stance, you know, naturally. That a so, boy. He was like he was uh, listening before, right? He knew how to yeah. come in. So, you know, and Sal, that's what's really cool is that you basically just said a lot of things that we covered earlier in the conversation. And that's the point of this, right, is to have like, you know, bring different chefs in the kitchen and kind of talk about different things. But then you got to understand the importance of a good onion or something like that, right? So it's that you get back to some of these common denominators because it's, it's information that I want to be able to share with coaches so that they can kind of have those aha moments. All right. And maybe go back and reevaluate some of the things they've been talking about and say, okay, maybe I need to you know, not be so much of this or so much of that, right? For sure. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to the next question with you guys. Okay, so what are, when you think about the best fielders you've ever seen, right, what are the traits of the best fielders in the game? And, you know, you can go baseball, softball. What, what characteristics and traits do the best fielders in the game have? What comes to your mind when you think of those fielders, when you, whoever that is? So maybe I'm, I'm going to think even who comes to mind, right? So when I ask you that, who comes to your mind? So, Tone, I'm going to start with you on that one. You know, um, I, I've been pretty lucky to work with a lot of uh, great softball players, Olympians, uh, Lovey, uh, who was it else, uh, Sierra Romero, and just, just watching them, uh, just be ready. Just be ready for, you know, and not missing a pitch. I know you hear not miss, you know, don't be late or don't miss a pitch. I, 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 you know, you hear that a lot about, you know, on offense, but defensively, you know, don't be late, be on time. And if you can keep that in mind and, and your game ready and expect that ball every single pitch, you know, th you know, th those, those two players that I just mentioned, uh, along with, you know, other players that we worked with, they, they just all have that, you know, uh, uh, they want the ball. They want the ball. You know, some players that uh, you see are a little nervous, you know, they don't want that ball hit to them. That ball is going to find you. <laughs> you know, so, so some of the best players, and even baseball, you know, you're just watching them. And, and I watch a lot of videos, and, and I just slow the videos down, uh, uh, slow motion, pause, rewind, and just watch their footwork, and they're all ready. They're all game ready. And, and in order to be the best, uh, you got to be ready. And some players, and in, in, in going back to what you were saying, uh, Sal, about Nate, Nate says, if you take a GoPro and we'll have it on every single player, you're going to see some players that aren't ready. You just, you just, they're missing pitches, and that ball is going to find you at that time. So just being ready every single pitch. Do you guys find that that readiness a lot of times goes hand in hand with, you know, who ends up being your shortstop? You know, those leaders of the field. Sure. Oh yeah. Yes. Well, you, 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 you know what, two tone. Uh, you can have you know, a player that's ready all the time, but there's that special player that, you know, that let's say a shortstop, you're looking for that most athletic infielder. And, you know, for, for me, what, what I'll do is, you know, you have that imaginary line between second and third and whoever has the most range. And what do you, what do you find in range? What are you looking for in range? Well, that first step and being able to read the ball, that first step and being able to read arm angles. So it allows you to go a little deeper uh, quick transfer, like Sal just said, not catching the ball and just being able to deflect. Uh, if you don't have that, you have to play in. So the best players at short play deep because they have that first step and they're able to read the ball off the bat. They have uh, nice uh, arm angles if needed. Uh, also that in the five, six hole, be able to come over the top and uh, quick hands. So um, again, just being able to, and, and again, going back to players that are different, you, you know, everyone can be ready, but everyone's not going to have that you know can everyone's not gonna be able to have 
uh, you know, great arm angles or have that first step. So, you know, those things will make you a great player. That's kind of interesting too, because look at catchers, right? Some catchers have the rocket arm and they can a little longer release drop back because they're going to make up that time on that, on that cannon shot. And then the ones that don't, that turnaround's even quicker, like a second baseman, right? It's not always a hard throw. It's a, it's a very quick throw. So I think that, that that's important. Um, you know, what, uh, how about you, uh, Vic? Um, I think you got to be smooth. You got to be smooth. I mean, being smooth, right? See, we preach that all the time. Um, you know, it shows a lot of confidence you know, and being smooth and not panicking uh, about making the play, and especially after the play, right? Even if the even if a player fails, right? Just get back up and, and, and come back and, and be smooth. I mean, I think that's super important. You know, we talk about our players, we say, we talk about TV shots, right? So after a player makes an error, and I don't know why I always go back to Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter throws <laughs> the ball away, camera goes on him. He's not shaking his arm. He's not like, oh, you know, that guy, he's just standing there, right? And then they go to his parents and his parents are just like nice and dignified. <laughs> And then they go to Joe Torrey, and Joe Torrey's got the toothpick in his mouth, and he doesn't even react. Like, you just sit there, he kind of shifts his eyes over to Don Zimmer and brings it back. You know, and if you think about softball reactions, the pitcher throws a pitch, she retraces it, shortstop throws the ball away, she's moving her arm around. Like, let's mimic that behavior because, you know, after you make an error, you, gotta, you just got to own it, just got to move on. Did any of you see the uh, – I don't know which Astros game it was, but they, they actually had a microphone on Korea at shortstop. And so the announcers were talking to Korea during the game in between pitches. And so it was interesting. They were asking him questions and then he's like, and then he waits and then he's ready. And it, I, I'd never seen that before. I'd never huh. seen an interview with a baseball player in the big leagues having to react to, you know, a potential seed hit right at him. But it was kind of interesting hearing him talk. And then when he needed to stop talking, so that he was engaged in the pitch. And it was about two seconds before the pitch, he would stop talking. And then he would pick up kind of where he left off. Because we could do that. We're out on the field, even if we're in the third base box, right? We're managing our team, we're giving signs, but we're actually giving a class at the same time going, okay, so I'm looking for this on deck batter. When I go up and call timeout, I'm gonna ask her what her approach is. And I'm looking to see how quick she answers that question, right? Because if she starts her sentence off with, uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's most likely she's gonna either take a good pitch or she's gonna swing at a bad one. So, you know, it's that kind of thing that I thought it was really kind of interesting to kind of them here to engage that. So, Jason, how about you? When you think about the best fielders out there, what do, what do they look like to you? To me, they got the loose limbs because they're loose. Their elbows are loose. Their legs are, are loose under them. They can go any way, you know, and I tell my girls to be like a, um, like a rubber band. You got to be able to go. If you got to go that way, you got to be able to go that way. And it starts with doing all the workouts and all that. I teach them you can't um, – make your body do something that you don't train it to do. So I try to get them to have loose limbs, coach, be um, light on their toes. I love it. Good stuff. react. And I noticed that the one, the loose, the loose limb ones, they got that swag and they're all moving around. You know how they move. <laughs> yeah. They got that look in the yeah. middles when they're moving around. And I like that in, in the middles. When they got that look, I know we're in for it on, we got we to gotta hit the ball that day. If not, <laughs> yeah. they're going to make plays, man. So being loose limb and being ready. I love it. Well, and, and being loose also, they catch more balls, right? There's no tension. So every yeah. muscle has an yeah. opposite muscle. When you're tenuous and you're anxious, you're squeezing the wrong muscles. You're sque it's like stepping on the brake and accelerator at the same time. When you're loose, man, everything just looks kind of loose. I call it loosey-goosey, right? Like the scarecrow in, in Wizard of Oz. So, uh, Sal, how about you? When you're looking at fielders, what will get you going when you see them do what? Um, for me, it – Oh, dang, that it all starts answer. with the feet. So, like, it, I can watch kids take ground balls, and if their feet are good, then I already know, like, everything else is going to come together. So, for me, it starts with the feet. Secondly, I would say that most of the elite infielders, they all do one thing. They all work downhill. They never sit back on their heels. They're always coming down on the ball. They're shortening the distance on the throw and cutting the distance on the throw. So, like, I look at Sis Bates. I watch her a lot. And I've yeah. never looked into what Sis's arm strength's like. But I notice she cuts the distance on every single throw. She's making every throw four or five feet shorter than the average shortstop. And it makes her look like she's got a stronger arm than maybe she does. Yeah. But she's always working down. Her, her first step is down. Even on smoke balls at her, she's always working downhill. Um, the third thing for me, which I think makes really elite infielders separate themselves, is understanding how to cheat. And what I mean by that is they anticipate and put themselves in the right position to make tough plays look routine. 
So what I mean by that is they're looking at bat angles at contact. They're understanding how their pitcher's ball's moving that day, what the swing's telling them, and they're anticipating based on all those things where the ball's going to hit, and that gives them that, that opportunity to sh shuffle over one step to their left. And now that ball that they're having to go glove side, now they're feeling it inside their left foot, and it just makes them look smoother. So for me, I always tell my girls, our whole objective with infielding is we want to make the root, the tough play look routine. Because when you can do that, it catches coach's eyes and they go, there's something different with that kid because I hit that ball to the same spot and she made it look easy and the other girl's having to dive, leave her feet or get extended outside of her body a lot. So what they didn't see was my infielders are going to watch that and they're going to cheat over a little bit to give themselves a little advantage and it, no one even seen it. Like, so when we pre-pitch walk up, we might walk up and shuffle over one. And now we just made that tough play look routine. So we teach a lot about reading what the batter's showing you and how your pitchers, pitchers are moving that day. So we cheat. I call it cheating, but it's just understanding the little things and getting, themself, getting ourselves in position. Again, because if you can make the tough play look routine, you're going to stand out. You're going to stand out and coaches are going to say, why does that kid make everything look easy? And it's not because she's a better athlete. She's just cheating. So we teach our girls how to cheat. Well, I think, you know, we can throw in that word anticipation, right? They're anticipating, you know, I yep. say, look, take, take guesses, you know, offensively, not random guesses. Guesses are, what do you think is going to happen based on what you see? So let's take, so a couple of things you mentioned, sis. And I love that you brought that up because I'll hear announcers talk about what a strong arm sis has. You know, if sis was, and I, I don't know what her num or speed would be on a radar gun, but it's not going to be this top number. But she understands the slot, so when the ball needs to spin 12 to 6, but she absolutely cuts down the angles and she puts herself in a position to shorten the distance to first base. And so she becomes where you would – you know, let's say Joe Pro Scout would go, she'll never be a shortstop in Division One. She's done got a strong enough arm and she's not big yep. enough, right? Because the ideal shortstops are longer, lankier, they can cover things up. But when you have someone that can play that position, there are certain things that go into it. And I think that that's, you know, that's a, a good point. Uh, and then for me, um, I, I think it's just being the, the anticipation part of it. Let's take like the screwball, right? So a right-handed screwball going into to right-handed batters. I, I want our shortstop to know our, our pitcher's location accuracy rate, right? Because if she's going to put one screwball over the middle of the white, we know that ball can hit, be hit the left center. And, but if she's really hitting her locations, then we know most of these balls are going to be hit to the left side. But now let's add in that speed factor, okay? If she's throwing hard enough to jam the right-handed batter, then myself as a shortstop or as a third baseman, I know that we're going to get these jam shots, these little bleeders just barely over the shortstop's head, have the, the left fielder having to come in. We're not going to see a lot of barreled shots that are pulling it down the line and then pulling a lot of balls foul because she's the one hard enough to jam those batters. So I need my shortstop to, to recognize that. But most importantly with our left fielder, because now let's say that we've got a great accuracy minded pitcher, but she's throwing not as hard. So it's, they're not going to pull the ball fair. They're not going to double in the gap because the ball's too close to the batter's body, but they're getting the barrel out. They're not jamming these batters. They're actually going to get more foul balls and foul territory. There might be a ball hit down the third base line, so maybe shade the line a little bit more with your third baseman. But most important for that left fielder, because when the barrel's getting out, the left fielder can now play closer to the left field line for those barrel out balls, and she can actually catch foul balls for outs. So there's nothing better than jamming a kid or pitching inside. She pulls the ball because it's the only place she can hit it. And your left fielder's by the fence catching an out in foul territory. I said, when you can get an out and the ball's not even hit in fair territory, boy, that really creates a disadvantage for the other team because it's like a free out. If we drop the ball, it's just going to be a foul ball anyways. So I think those anticipating and then obviously the off-speed stuff, right? For the shortstop to know that that off-speed low and away pitch and you're going to get ground. That's a shortstop stream, man. It's something low and away, off-speed, and you're going to get ground ball. You know you're going to make six to eight plays that day, and that's like what you, what you dream about, right? So that, that's good stuff right there. So All Tony, right, guys. Tony, with that said, is, is your defense coming in and peeking in on those signs? Are they communicating every pitch? So um, you, you, we're always trying to be prepared for who's taking in information. 
because again, that's how you, you relay information to your team. So you want to know which teams are picking up on your movement, picking up on anything. So that's to us, it's always going to depend on, we always want to disguise things as much as possible, right? But if there's a team not communicating and we can get an extra foot this way or that way, we're going to go ahead and do that. But we're always listening. All right, we're always listening to see if they're giving information to each other that's going to give them a heads up on what's going to happen next. So sometimes we'll go early, Vic, and sometimes we're going to do it on the pitch. It's like, you know, the, the fielder that tips away most pitches is the center fielder for most teams. Center fielders tip, you know, and the other thing is that shortstops don't realize how to recognize a third base coach that's standing deeper in the box and she's wiggling her fingers on change-ups, and she doesn't realize that that the third base coach is the one giving this the making the noise, right? That the that right. The, I should I shouldn't be saying this shit because it's a it's how you win a lot of games, but that's where you're getting your information, right? You're you're facing you know the Thunderbolts, the Bandits. You're facing these pitchers that are going on to Alabama. You need every bit of information that you can get offensively or defensively, like everything that you can. So something on a steal, whatever it is, and so every bit of information can be the difference in that half inch that can determine the outcome of a game that's the beauty of the game right the mistake can cost you the game the play can, can get you the game so it's just which way it which way it works so right because like i noticed recently at the younger ages a lot of those defenses and t we've talked about this the corners come in the short like there's 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 so much anticipation on that that are they ready for the play you know and, and this is at like 12s now you know and you know that's that's what i was asking yeah i talk about with our coaches like at what level do you guys have trouble winning Right. So you're teaching all these fundies, you got these things and you can't get past so and so his best team in that organization. You faced him 10 times and you can't get past that team. You might be getting closer. And what is it like? What is it about those yeah. teams? You know, there are a couple of teams out there that will go five infielders on your slappers and throw you all drop balls. You know, part of the theory is you don't want to let a slapper put the ball on the ground to run it out. But if you know where that pitch is going, uh, you know, I can name these coaches. They, they've, they've really done a good job with their pitchers. And they're basically you're hitting into their defense and you're making, you're giving them a lot of routine outs and you can, you can pick up on that because part of that is nobody's going to feel 20 balls in a row, but you also have to know when you're making a defense's job really, really easy. And so at that point, we're not going to try to lift that ball. We're going to try to squib it with our, with our slappers. We're not trying to bounce it. We're trying to get it to do those funny spins. Cause as we were talking about earlier, when infielders over attack, that's when all of a sudden they're not playing that ball true. And we get that one little squibber and we get that runner on first base with, with one out in the sixth inning, right? Bunner over and then fake bunt steal with a runner on second, you know, so we really, really <laughs> never even hit one, one ball hard, right? <laughs> yeah. It's firecracker stuff only, Tony. We, yeah, we, yeah. we can tell the firecrackers. We, we can edit that. We can edit that. Actually, hey, I, think, I think all firecracker coaches need to know if it's one signature winning play, all firecracker coaches need to know the fake bunt steal and how to, how to win a ball game. I think I got that from Joe Martinez in Dallas this week is that he won a ball game with fake bunt steal and then squeezed her home. Never hit the ball hard. Hey, Vic, make I, have a t I have a little trick with your middles. Uh -huh. So if you don't want to give away positioning and showing like, say you have middle infielders that peek in or maybe they don't pick in, maybe you're going off cards and they know it's an inside pitch against a righty or whatever. So one of the tricks we teach so we don't tip, is as our shortstop's walking up, we just have them drag their foot like they're cleaning the ground and no one's seeing that they're moving. So at, you know how a batter goes in the batter's box and sweeps the ground and moves things right. around? Right. So that's how we'll do that so we can scoot over without seeing someone noticing we're legitimately scooting over. You know what I mean? So that's a, so that's a great like up, a – go ahead, go ahead. So as they're walking up into their position, uh -huh. say they got the pitch and they know it's – maybe an inside pitch and they they're anticipating the ball's going to get pulled. So instead of taking a peek in walking back and then just legitimately shuffling over, they'll kind of just clean up the dirt and act like they're cleaning the ground and getting rocks out of their way as they're sliding over and getting themselves into position. So no one ever picks up that they're moving yeah. to get themselves in position based on the pitch location, but they are. So now, now we just, now we just gave away a little <laughs> or, tip. Or even on, going to your outfield, <clears throat> huh? you know, shade, hey, you, you turn around, take a look at your outfield, and you're, you're walking out there, and you just stay yep. there since I pitched. Yep. Something like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot all, of little All tricks. different ways to do it, right? Uh, Sal, yep. I, would, I would love it. Again, this could be with your phone, right? Like, like take a, a, a two-minute video, but from different perspectives. Go to the first base dugout right? And say, look yes. at from the other team's side, this is their dugout. This is what they're seeing. So look at our yeah. shortstop. You don't even realize that she's now a foot and a half over to her right. Like to, to yep. get some different vantage points where you could see her, maybe even one from the outfield, right? So what the okay. left fielder sees or something, she's kind of shifting. But at the end, 
Now as the pitch is thrown, you see that she's already got her ground a little bit because it's little tricks like that. Like that, that's gold nugget stuff right there. That's good stuff. <laughs> Love it. All right, guys. Um, all right, one more question for you. Okay. If you were to help coaches that are learning how to teach defense, what is one drill or what is one place that they should start to, so that they're building the right blocks for their teams? What's a good drill that you can give to coaches or talk about, hey, start in this area, start at this tempo, whatever it is. But what advice can we give to coaches that are out there working with their teams on a basic starting point? Because like anything else, especially with batting, we can digress, digress, we go through, you know, we start on one topic and then we're on 12 other topics. In the end, the kids like, all know, they all know what they're doing wrong, but they don't have one thing they're doing right, right? So what can we pass on to coaches that would really be of value to them and that are just simple concept drills that they can build some good blocks with, with their kids? So Jason, I'm gonna start with you since you're the master of working with what you got laying around in the yard too. So what, what do you got for uh, For me, coach, I look for, um... I would teach them to get to that right left on the balls at them if they're the younger kids, you know, at the balls to them. If you're not approaching the ball with that right left, you're in a world of hurt already right, right there. So for me, starting on the balls and feet, we, we teach them the 100 drill. The ball's coming at you 50, you're attacking the ball 50. That's what we do. If it's coming at you 20, you're coming at it 80. But when you get there, you better be on your right left, you know, ball on your left eyeball. Right, left, getting ready to go wherever you're going. That's so, awesome. Getting to that right, left for the younger ones, to me, is vital. I notice they all get there and their foot's squared up and they got extra movement after that, you know, instead of just flowing right to the right, left, and you're going. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to shoot a quick little video of that as well, too. That's good stuff, right? Just You know, again, we, we, it doesn't need to be five minutes, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Hey, this is what we're talking about, the first two steps, the right, left, that's really important to us. Just short little in the pockets. I keep thinking of like diamond demo stuff, right? Like there's, there's a lot of little nuggets that we can be sharing you guys and going back out to your practices and then bringing them back in and sharing them on these discussions. I think that would be like really cool. So that's, that's good stuff, Jason. Thank you. Vic, how about you? Uh, one of the great drills that, that I've seen girls progress with at the younger ages is, is working on the short hops. And what, uh, what Tony does at a lot of his clinics, he uses uh, the pitch machine dimple balls, right? And uh, we use those because you get obviously a better bounce. And then we start progressing with having them recognize the different hops, you know, the long hop, the short hop, the in-between. Um, and then we challenge them with, you know, the, uh, the, the, the long hop where they're running and they keep their bodies, their feet moving, and then they transfer in the air. I mean, there, there's a lot with the short hop, especially for infielders. And we've seen that from, you know, starting at 10 years old, and then they progress, and they just keep elevating. And, and we do a great contest at the end of our clinics, a short hop contest. Once again, competitiveness, challenging them, and that, that's the thrill of the clinics all the time. Right, T? Yeah, you know, and, 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 and I was going to say the same thing. I mean, there's <laughs> no getting around – the short hop, and I'm not talking about that grounder that's just rolling. And yeah. the only thing you got to worry about there is that ball taking a bad bounce. And going back to what Sal was saying about the hands, you know, being a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but for younger players and just coaches, just as many reps as possible with the short hop. Short hop, you got the long hop, and you can get a little, you know, uh, it can get a little complicated. I know there's some trainers out there that, you know, this bounce, just, just keep it simple. The long hop, the short hop, in between. Stay away from that in-between hop. If you can identify that hop, you know, that it's going to be an in-between, you know, for young players, go and get that. Go and get that. And create, create your own hops. Uh, and, and just understand that. Hop. And that's going to happen with reps. So, I mean, e e seriously, it's the short hop drill. You can go into, you know, right, left. You can go into attack. If you understand the hops and, and add a bunch of reps, you know, to that, you're going to figure it out. I got this kid named Hollywood. One day, I don't know, we took about uh, four buckets of balls, and we were just basically just understanding hops. So she would say long hop, you know, and Jay calls it the Sunday hop in Hawaii. So that long hop in Hawaii, that's a Sunday hop. It doesn't matter. That's the hop you're looking for. And then if you can't get that, you want to get the short hop. If, and, and if you see that in-between hop where it's going to eat you up, you know, don't let it eat you up again. Go get that. Maybe at an advanced age, you can maybe open up. I think Sal and I talked a little bit about maybe open up a little bit so this is a little easier if you kind of drop step to your left. But for younger kids, the short hop. And, and use those bouncy balls and just help them understand. And kind of going back to what you were saying, Tony, when coaches are like, attack it. 
why would you ever want to attack a Sunday hop that's just a candy hop that's right to you right there? Now you go attack it because you haven't seen enough reps. Now it's in your throat. And it becomes an in-between hop and, and you bobble it. So, you know, just, again, keep it simple, three hops, and understand that. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. But for those young players, it, it's the short hop. I like uh, tennis balls, dimple balls that you guys are talking about. Sometimes the worst place to learn hops or oftentimes the worst place to le learn hops is on the dirt, right? An unmanicured field and some, <laughs> some butcher boy with a bat out there. And so that, I, oh, I don't even want to read those hops. I'm trying to read my body parts. So, you know, balls against the wall, right? Tennis balls, wall drills, uh, uh, um, black top, cement, uh, turf. You know, so again, what you're getting is you're getting what we call the true hops, right? Learning how to read the true hops. And then as you build what we call kind of bottom up. So when we're on the field, we're always prepared for a hop that doesn't come up. It's going to stay down. We go low to high and stuff like that. But, you know, for coaches out there, again, just get some tennis balls. Grab, you know, get yourself a few dozen of them. Bounce the balls of the kids and those, those kind of work out. So that, that's good stuff. Uh, Sal, how about you? Moving on to helping out coaches with some easy drills. Um, I would say what's – what. What's given us some success is teaching it in progression and isolation. So what I mean by that is we'll isolate the feet or we're doing, doing a lot of footwork drills on the ladders, learning how to control our body movements. Um, and then we'll do hands up. So we're down on our knees and we're learning. So we'll, in regards to the hops, we teach them to count the hops. So I'll hit ground balls to the girls and I'll tell them how many hops, they'll go two. How many is that? Three, one. So we're actually seeing downward trajectory on the swing and then we count hops because that allows us to hone in on the hops and allows us to create what hop we want. So we do a lot of drills on our knees where we're working on posture and we're working on just the hands and deflections and transfers and getting into the right arm slot and then we'll do a lot of footwork drills separate where we're not throwing. So we isolate the two and then we'll put them together. And that's helped. We've been doing that since the girls, the girls that have been with me for like three years, they still do a lot of that work today. We'll isolate it. So we'll go feet and then hands. But what I would say to any coach that wants to get into teaching infield at an elite level, one of the tools that the players should have is a jump rope. Um, you got to get the kids light on their feet. They got to understand how to, how to have rhythm and timing. So jump rope ladders, those are huge. And when we do our ladders, we don't do them like football. Um, we don't do high knees. We do short little steps because as an infielder, you can't field the ball when your feet are up off the ground. So we try to maintain as much contact with the ground as possible, but yet cover a lot of space. So all of our ladder drills are very quick, short, twitchy, but we're gaining ground and moving our feet. So we, it's weird, like when people see our, our agility work for our infielders, they think we're training defensive backs. But, I mean, DBs are some of the most athletic athletes in the world. They got to cover people running full speed backwards, and they got to be able to sink their hips, change direction, you know, come in and out of their breaks. So we do a lot of stuff that um, isolates the lower half and then the upper half. And then even when we get into our, we just go, don't go right into fungos. We'll do a lot of work with the buckets in a controlled environment so we can create certain balls. And then the fourth thing for me, I think probably may be the most important, especially for the younger kids, is coming up with rules. Whatever those rules are for your program, you gotta have rules because what rules do, it allows the kids to relax and not think and just, use their instincts. So what I mean for that, by that, like for example, at shortstop on our team, when we're turning the double play, our rules are this. If the ball's hit right at you, you're in double play depth. We offset our left foot, get our toe pointed toward the bag so we don't have to step and we throw it. Any ball that pulls us even one step towards the bag, we split and feed. Any ball that goes to our right, that's the only ball we field on our right foot as a shortstop. So those are rules the girls understand. So now when the ball's hit, they don't think. They just do what the rules tell them to do. So they're not like, do I throw this one? Do I feed this one? Do I fill this one on my right? So there's rules. Same thing at second base. Ball hit at our second baseman. They either, if it creates direction to the bag, they counter and go. Or they, what we, do, what we call skateboard or pivot. And they throw it. Any ball deep in the hole towards first, they reverse pivot. And any ball 
towards the bag, we feed it either backhand or split and go. So these are rules that allow the girls to relax and let the ball tell them based on the rules what they're going to do and they don't have to think. Now they just, they let their instincts take over and they just apply the rules. What I see is most kids that don't have rules or are being taught rules, they don't know. So now the ball right at them, they're, 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 they're not sure. Do I feed this one? Do I throw this one? What do I do? And if they're thinking when the ball's in play, that's where the mistakes happen. So you, for me, applying rules is extremely important. So this way they don't have to think and they just react. You know what's crazy, Sal? That's, that's man, that's, that's what I use for my younger kids. Uh, 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 an imaginary line. If you're playing second base, you're in double play depth. Imaginary line between you and the batter, anything right at you, maybe, you know, drop to that left knee, anything to the right, even if it's a uh, half a foot, it's a flip or feed, anything yep. to your left's a pivot. And those are rules. Yeah. Love yep. it. Man, we're, dude, we might be brothers, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, guys, I mean, that, but that's what this is about. And, then, and there's some common language here. But again, the whole point is that not all chefs are the same, right? Everyone's got a little different something, but it is great to see certain commonalities and certain denominators that, that everyone has, yeah. but that's, you know, the whole outcome. And, and my, my suggestion to coaches is especially like, don't, don't worry about what you don't know. Don't try to be something you're not though. So stick in your pocket because this game can be very simply taught a uh, couple of rules. If the drill's not successful, change the drill. So every now and then I'm probably 80 to 85% success oriented because until that's built in where it becomes second nature, I only want to challenge and disrupt their mind and, and give them a lack of, of result success, maybe 10 to 15% of the time. I always want our fielders expecting to throw the ball on the mark. I want them to expect it to make the play. I want them to be, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm sure you guys had this th thought growing up every play. I, I, I want to think as many as I could. I was always saying to myself, I'm about to make the best play of my life. I'm about to make the greatest play I've ever made. And then you, you'd you have a ball, you'd die for it. You make the play, you get up, you go, my God, I just thought about that. Like right before, just this whole readiness that you kept talking about, Tony, that state of mind. How can we build that as coaches? Remember, as coaches, we're going to create that. If we don't inspire our players and we're just informing them, then they're not, they don't have that kind of readiness, right? They don't have that kind of readiness where they want to make a great play because just like Sal said, they're thinking about how they're going to make a play. So listen, guys, I think we have a lot of potential with this because I think that it's, it's, um, it's, it's a part of our game that could still be expanded. I think that there's a lot of polish and a lot of, I always say, I'd like to take an eight to 10 year player and show her how to play the game so that she's really expressing herself and she doesn't look like she's constantly learning it, even though, we're all learning. I've learned tonight. But to get them to that point to where it's music, right? That, that's, you know, the characteristic and trait for me is that it looks like you're dancing out there, that your feet don't even look like they're making a sound when they hit the ground and everything is just fluid. There's nothing segmented and it just kind of moves and it's absolutely beautiful. To watch. And I think that if we can incorporate some of our dialogue and then I would challenge you guys to take these videos, right? 30 seconds so we can show them on these, on these discussions. Take a picture, just keep it on your phone. We'll, sh we'll, we'll get better at sharing the screen and stuff. Um, you know, the last thing I'm gonna tell everybody that might be listening to this when we, when we air this is that, look, I've been pretty fortunate. You know, we've been pretty fortunate with our particular teams and we've had a lot of players that have gone on and have really great success and they've been known for their, their fielding. But I'm gonna be honest with you, most of the stuff you guys are talking about, I've never even thought about. Like for me, I'm, an, I'm a visual outcome guy. I'm basically copying the dance move. So to hear about what goes into the dance move, to hear you know, the left heel up is before it comes down, you know, I, I've been able to kind of find that, but it's, it's a different process. So the learning for me is like a lot of these coaches that I would hope kind of get into this and go, wow, I've never really looked at it from that end of it. And the good news to all of these coaches are like, look, if a guy like me can create a physical outcome that's done pretty well at the highest levels of the game, all of you can, because we take this from my brain, what you guys are sharing, and just try to make our coaches better. And again, just try to give them more power for their punch for all the investment that people are put in with, with you know, putting, putting their, their blood and soul in the, F, in the F organization. So I really, really appreciate you guys. You guys are really good. I learned a lot tonight, and I, I love the common denominator stuff. But bottom line is, Jason, it feels good, right? It feels like we're out in the back just having a party out there and just oh, yeah. about to pull some pork and 
light the fires and everything else. Pull so. some pork. Uh, We're going to pull some pork when you guys come, because guaranteed. Let's man, I, I, was, I was just watching a show, and it was about this these people like in deep Mexico that are still taking the meat and burying it into the ground a whole night we before. They pull, and they pull it out in the, mor- the next morning, and they said it's the best tasted meat you could ever have, man. It's good stuff like you'll, that. So don't get me going. Or we're going to we might do a cooking show on the next one and, and, and we'll, just, you know, we'll get that. So anyways, guys, thank you. really appreciate it. You're all awesome. Appreciate everything that you're doing for the organization, making us look good. I'll reach out to you. And every two or three weeks, we're going to have a defensive discussion. Okay? All right, ladies. I love it. Get after it. Hey, hey, take us home and show us a little drill something. What are they doing, yeah, Jason? Show us, Jay. Oh. Keep working. Keep working. Oh. Oh. I love it. We talked about Look the footwork. Yes. Nope. Selling right now. South. Hold it. I love we're doing it. what we can, coach. That's all That's we're good doing. Stuff. Right Keep up the great work. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, Appreciate you, guys. you. Thank you guys for everything, right. guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Bye.